Um, so our uh, final main talk for this uh, morning session will be from uh, Ajit Singh, who um, is Managing Director and General Partner of Artiman Ventures. He's going to be telling us a little bit about therapeutics, but more about innovation, I think. I, I go through TSA about 400 times a year. <laughs> But the only medal I have is my frequent flyer club card on Lufthansa. So you invited me about a year ago, two days after the last symposium. And of course, I was excited. I should actually restate it. I was excited. The key word is was. Um, <clears throat> euphoria lasted about a year, till about a week ago, I got this agenda from Coressa, and I saw the list of speakers. I thought, holy shit, what am I going to do in this conference? <laughs> um, intimidation. And I, I was reminded of my, my first ever presentation in the US. The year was 1986, uh, fresh graduate student um, after having done undergrad in India. And I went to a conference where we were talking about how the visual cortex understands motion. And the conference was in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. So imagine a turban guy, polyester shirt, pen protectors, as nerdy as it gets. In, in Alabama. Now what's worse is there was some thunderstorm that evening. This was September, very un unseasonal. And most flights were canceled into Birmingham and the whole nine yards. And on the morning of my presentation, really like an expectant father, you know, at 7.45, I'm pacing up and down, and, and nobody's there. <laughs> Crestfallen, I mean, I'm here giving my first presentation and I don't have an audience, but also somewhat relieved, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually, there were three people in the audience. So I first wondered if I'm in the right place. I eventually started to talk. And two people who were sitting in the back, about 10 minutes into the presentation, just you know, silently walked away. <laughs> I'm left with one person now. <laughs> and I finished my talk. Um, he even asked a question and eventually clapped and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm ready to leave. And he goes, you can't leave now, in a southern drawl that I cannot replicate. Why? Because I'm the next speaker. <laughs> so when I was preparing to, to speak here, I was actually taken back some 28 years memory lane. I, I met this really wonderful person a year later. His name is Eric Reinhardt. He ran Siemens Medical for about 15 odd years. And he was the only boss I had. And probably one of the best thing that can happen to a young graduate who is looking to figure out what to do with life. One of the first statements he made was, innovation is a random walk. And I've thought about that statement quite often. When you were reading your Kill NSF Riot Act, I was reminded of that statement. Oh, it's mostly a random walk. You cannot anticipate in advance. He used to do some, so he goes, then we should take random walks. So he used to do some really crazy things. So he used to have a red wine seminar in, in Black Forest. He used to take us on random walks to museums and, and, and parks and stuff. He used to say, let's have an inefficient meeting. <laughs> let's, let's have an inefficient meeting. He was, we, if you can check box everything, you don't need a meeting. You send an email. If you just have to inform people, send an email. If you're going to discuss something, don't set an ending time. Just talk. In one of those random walks, he took us to a museum in Amsterdam. So we flew from Munich, so my Lufthansa days, or still continue to be, to Amsterdam. And uh, there was a Van Gogh uh, uh, display. And where the, 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 the underlying statement was, emphasize the essential and leave the obvious vague. Bryce in the room, by any chance? Bryce, with him? Yeah. So emphasize the essential, leave the obvious vague. In this talk, I'm going to do the opposite. Emphasize the obvious and leave the essential vague. A, I can survive this presentation by doing it. At the end, you'll say that was obvious. That was my goal, obviously. Right? <laughs> And second, I haven't done hard science in about 20 years, so that's uh, probably a good way to start. So I have two broad vignettes. First is, what can we learn from nature? And then second is, can we apply that to this general field of diagnostics, which is what I mostly invest in. So what I'm going to do is step aside and let the pictures do the talking. So there's a short journey through a place of truly immense diversity. And most of you have read the title of the talk, so it kind of gives away what I'm going to say. But We'll work with that. I mean, look at these pictures. Anybody been to Galapagos? I mean, I'm sure many been to Galapagos. Oh, wow, good, perfect. That was 8.2% of this audience.
my favorite. By the way, Galapagos does mean turtle in, in Spanish, or some variant of it. So small archipelago, very rich diversity of life on land, on water, in air. And of course, the natural question is where and why. And the where is as beautiful as this. Check that out. And of course, to contextualize that, that's about 1,800 miles, a little southeast of, uh, of, uh, of Ecuador. Um, so, so now the, the question is, why am I showing this? So if you are on land at the coastline in any of these islands, there's about 100 to 500 species, so 10 to the 2. If you go a mile away into the ocean, also somewhere between 100 and 500 species in a typical 10, cube by, 10 meter by 10 meter by 10 meter place. So again, 10 to the 2. If you go about 100 meters off the coast, one million species. Go 100 feet away from the coast, 100 meters from the coast, one million species in a 10 meter by 10 meter by 10 meter piece. So why is there so rich a diversity at this very perfectly formed place that is about 100 meters from the coastline? So uh, the question of why is explained by three broad parameters, one of which is the coral reefs there. And it's, it's truly a nature's platform for innovation for the following reasons. So number one, the, the temperature is right. So perfectly preserved 98.6 degrees, where a lot of good stuff can happen. Second, there is ocean currents, three ocean currents coming, one from south, one from east, one from so northwest, that bring in very diverse life very diverse molecules to this melting pot. And then there's the coral reefs, both flexible and rigid, that allow the turbulence of the water to churn and mix up this stuff. And of course, there's a natural mixing of diversity because of that. And now evolution sets in, connections are made, failures are discarded, and rather quickly, and that gives us a perfect platform for innovation of nature, life. Something to learn from in where the human-made innovation can work and how. So I'll give you one example, completely unbiased, obviously. <laughs> so I, Silicon Valley is an interesting place. When I, when I moved to Germany, this was some 20-odd years ago, there was a few interesting cultural experiences for me. I used to think Germany is a very hierarchical culture. It's actually probably the most egalitarian place I ever lived in. Everyone can express an opinion before a decision is made. After a decision is made, there's perfect hierarchy. And rightfully so, I think it has some relevance. Silicon Valley, it's probably a good number too. I mean, I grew up in a culture that was anything but egalitarian, India. I mean, what makes Indians Indians is we live with our natural contradictions all the time, perfect hierarchy, perfect repression, perfect lack of thinking, perfect non-listening skills. I mean, it's just the ultimate antidote to innovation. <laughs> so why is, this so hard, why is this so hard to replicate in other, in other cultures? So you will see where I came from and you read the next three slides, very hierarchical cultures. So growing up in India, you couldn't really ask a question of a professor. You couldn't ask a question mostly even of your parents. Things are changing, but the system was inherently very hierarchical. Very poor diversity of viewpoints. Diversity of viewpoints is not encouraged. By the way, we have similar disease now in the United States in early schooling. I mean, we're making perfectly formed. Have, there was this Greek myth of the bed of Euphrates, I think. Sorry? Thank you. I, my Greek mythology is not that good, so thank you. And, and this guy used to invite guests, and he had a fixed size bed, and he used to cut their limbs off to make them fit the bed. <laughs> Damn, we're doing that to our kids now. Well, we did that in India for, for many hundred years. And, and very poor listening skills. This kills us. This kills us. Um, so I, I just turned 50. And in, in sort of the evolving framework of my own social infrastructure in my life, I'm finally realizing I'm not a good listener. Well, at least I'm realizing it. I haven't done, I haven't been able to do much about it. But listen, <laughs> listening is not encouraged. Listening is, when Reinhardt said, have an inefficient meeting, that was he was trying to encourage listening. 
Because when, when I know I have sufficient time, maybe, maybe I will listen, as opposed to have my gun ready to fire. The moment I find a 30 picosecond wedge of air time, bang, I need to make my point. Bad for innovation, really bad for innovation. So now, so why, why is the listening skill issue important? So there's a, there's a belief I have, and I'll illustrate it through some examples. So I have a model, so I'm finding the right data to fit that model, is transdisciplinarity is very critical for disruptive innovation. And I use the word transdisciplinarity as opposed to inter interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary. So the choice of words is important only if I describe what I mean by the word. It has to be trans. We have to kind of transcend viewpoints and, and work through them. Transdisciplinarity requires true dialogue. It requires two things, actually. True dialogue and going back to first principles. So scientists in the room, most of you, ask yourself an honest question. How often do we go to first principles? How often do we ask the question, but why? And it's natural. It's natural we want to build on the prior experiences, but every so often it's worthwhile to take a break, step back, and say, but why? What's the first principle? I'll give some examples in a second. So here's my 20 years of learning on a true dialogue. It took a lot of dialing. I had to insert a comma, delete a semicolon. Uh, so it, it took some while to figure out. So let's, let's start at the bottom. True dialogue cannot happen when you don't listen at all. Okay, so an efficient meeting, an egotistical meeting, a hierarchical culture kills it. True dialogue also cannot happen when you pretend to listen. Oh, that's an art I mastered. I mean, I, you could look right through me, and I'll give you this impression, yeah, of course, yeah, absolutely. And, and ask me two minutes later, I don't have a clue what you said. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a totally different script playing in my mind. Most of us are able to do it well. Most intelligent people can fake listening rather well. And then you pick up one or two keywords, and you ask a question at the end about a keyword. Now you clearly listen. Now, now comes the important point. Sometimes we listen, but out of generosity. Hierarchical cultures really, really cultivate that. You listen out of generosity. Yeah, I'm, uh, mm -hmm. You come listen, talk to me, and I'll listen to you, like you do when you submit a request proposal to, to NIH, and somebody listens to you. Right? It's, now, but, so true dialogue can happen when two people listen to each other with genuine curiosity to understand the other person's viewpoint. So A, it has to be out of curiosity, not generosity. It, I have to want to know your viewpoint. So I have to see not what you're saying, but what you want to say. Transdisciplinarity thrives on the curiosity to want to understand. So why, why am I evangelizing this? Why am I just making a big deal out of it? Because it's too obvious. And yet we don't do it. OK. Uh, the, the second precondition for, for disruptive innovation is, is first principles. So I'll, I'll use this anecdote. Most of us are familiar with this picture. Most of us had that in our home at some point. Britannica was founded by three Irishmen in the late 1700s and then sold it to one of the British newspapers who sold it to Chicago Tribune. And, and I learned about this in a book called How the Irish Saved the Civilization. By God, by then I had not used the word Irish and civilization in the same sentence. The <laughs> book was phenomenal. How the Irish monks passed on oral wisdom was truly cool. So this, this company had total sales of $650 million in 1995. In 2005, anyone's guess? Perfect. 50 million, round it up or down, it's zero. Why? What happened? Sorry? Google? What else? Wikipedia? What else? Th those are perfectly good answers. Let's go to first principles. If you think that Google or Wikipedia replaced Britannica, that would somehow assume that we first used, earlier we used to use Britannica for referencing, for looking up things, and now we use Google. Does that, so of all of those who had Britannica at home, how often did you open it? <laughs> no. So when Britannica started to die, Chicago Tribune said, let's do an experiment and figure out how often does a Britannica owner open Britannica at home. And they went back to year 2000 by when there was not that much in name of Google. The average time 
the average number of times a person opens Britannica at home is two per year. And today, you know, while I'm trying to exit the aircraft after having landed in, in, in Denver, I'm looking up at least five things by the time I arrive at the baggage claim. So clearly it wasn't looking up. Something else was happening. So why did people buy Britannica? So let's go to first principles. Why did they buy Britannica? It looks good on the shelf, reason number one. <laughs> and, sorry? Exactly right, exactly right. The second reason people buy Britannica or bought Britannica was for their children. Opportunity. So it was, it was a $1,500 parental guilt mitigation device <laughs> for, for double income families. Now I think we're getting close to the answer. So by 2000, year 2000, there was another $1,500 parental guilt mitigation device. What was that? The laptop, the computer. So internet did not kill Britannica. Computer did. Okay? Now, of course, once the computer was there and internet was there, now finally we could do search very efficiently, and, and Google was born, and a few hundred billion in value was created, and, and encouraged me to become a VC, and you know, all the things you like to do as an immigrant. So where do I go from there? So our, our onus then is to kind of sift beneath this chaos on the surface that clouds are non-first principle thinking and go to first principles. So we want to look through Picasso's outer shell and find the Velasquez that lies beneath. So go back. It's actually the same picture. Picasso was obsessed with this for those who, who enjoy art. He made some 52 different renditions of the Las Meninas, which is now, I think, at the, at the Prata in, in Madrid. And you can focus on any part of the picture, like this man in the doorway, or with the, the girl, or the dog, and go back and find each one of those guys here. So our job is to look beyond the apparent chaos on the surface and find the pattern underneath. That's a critical precondition for innovation. So having inefficient meetings Having random walks is a worthwhile use of time for innovation. So then I used a phrase, disruptive innovation, so it deserves to be explained. Question is, what is disruptive innovation? I'll take two examples. First kind happens when a product or a technology or a substance or a concept is introduced. The performance actually goes down quite a bit. But the cost goes down so much that the adoption becomes imperative by some other branch of society. Eventually, the, the performance creeps up, the cost remains where it is, and it becomes a standard. An example would be the home pregnancy test. So I'll use a diagnostic example. Its, uh, it's um, sensitivity, sensitivity, yes, not, I haven't done hard science in a long while, was about seven points lower than the tests that were used, being used at the point of care at the time but the cost was two orders of magnitude lower. And now the standard lateral flow amino assay is the standard of care. If you look at inkjet printers versus laser printers, if you look at any new memory technology for the computers compared to the previous version. So imagine, imagine going, let's say take a new, new generation ultrasound machine, handheld, imagine going to a radiologist or a gynecologist or a OBGYN and say, well, I'm, I'm going to give you this innovation that'll lower your performance. Try that. Yeah. However, however, take this handheld ultrasound, which by the way works off of sound, and go to seven million paramedics and 23 million nurses, and say, I'm going to give you a better stethoscope. Well, a lot has to be worked on and say, how much can this new ultrasound can be used at point of care and for what? But it has to be adopted by a different segment of society. Eventually, performance catches on. Happened when you went from laser printers to inkjet printers, that's what happened. So first generation inkjet printers were blotchy, dotty, didn't have the color, were very slow. Today that's a standard. Because initially it got adopted not by the office but by the home. Eventually it became a standard in the office, at home, and every place else where you did mass copying. So one kind of disruptive innovation is when the performance initially goes down as opposed to go up but the cost goes down so much that adoption is imperative. 
So we'll talk about point of care diagnostics and direct to consumer diagnostics in infectious disease that might illustrate the principle better. There's a second kind. Think of Amazon. What did Amazon do? It took a very inefficient value chain. By the way, I hate Amazon for some other reasons. I love going to my corner bookstore and talk to the bookseller. So there is, at an emotional level, I'm very connected to an old bookstore. I still go to places just to go to old bookstores. Is that anybody from Australia here? Sydney? Newtown? Yeah. King Street? Yeah. Across from? <laughs> There's a bookstore called Thornstock. Probably one of the best bookstores I've ever visited, and, and inexpensive too. So what did Amazon do? It took a very inefficient value chain that goes from writer to publisher to printer to wholesaler to local retailer to local local retailer to the consumer. Extremely inefficient and took all of the intermediaries out, disintermediated the value chain, and then reconfigured the value chain. Imagine so many markups of margin that were Im immediately released. And that value went to someone else. But that's not only it. Something else happened. So when you, when you do this reconfiguration of value chain, you'll see the applications in medicine in a second. When you deconstruct the value chain, something else happens as well. You decouple the economy of things with the economy of information. So in a bookstore, the thing is coupled to the information. So both move very slow. So information about the book is you browse, and the book is what you pick up, the physical piece of paper. What this deconstruction did, it decoupled the thing that sits in a warehouse somewhere in actually close to Denver, or in Memphis, Tennessee, at FedEx headquarters, and the information sits somewhere on the cloud. And you inherently decoupled it. And by decoupling, you make information move at its own pace, and things move at its own pace. Imagine a reference lab. Imagine a reference lab. The tissue samples go places. The slides go places. Can you ship bytes instead of samples? Could you bring enough to the point of care so that the information is reduced from a sample to a byte that's made available that a super specialist can read anywhere? So deconstructing and reconfiguring a value chain releases value, but also allows for other kinds of innovation. We could not have imagined 15 years ago that Amazon would allow books to be done, downloaded on demand and being read and so on. I haven't been able to, con to convince myself to read off of Kindle. My, my uh, children tell me it will happen one day. Uh, OK, so, so things you could do at a significantly lower cost or things you couldn't do at all. Let's correlate to medicine. You can automate standards of care, or you can redefine standards of care. So what trends do we see in diagnostics because of that? I see five sort of broad levers that will cause disruption in, in this one area that I understand somewhat. So first is a movement towards decentralization. So take the, the example of uh, disintermediation from Amazon that I talked about and apply it to, so why did reference labs come about? Why did clinical reference labs come about? Quality, Quality. excellent. What else? Expense. Expense, what else? Difficulty, absolutely right. What else? Speed. So reference labs came about for all the right reasons some 30 odd years ago. To, to control quality, you had to have it at one place so people can learn and so on and so forth. When you, a la Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hours of experience, all of that stuff all makes sense. However, there is, a, there is a misperception there. The optimization was done for the lab. If you try to do the optimization for the healthcare system, Highly suboptimal. And what happened, we, we got an innovation called Reference Lab, and somehow the idea stuck. We kept improving the Reference Lab. We kept improving the Reference Lab. So logistics became faster, FedEx planes were bought, and da da da. It, we were just continuously optimizing the Reference Lab. But we were actually suboptimizing the healthcare system. So now, ask today, 30 years later, have technology improvements in either spectroscopy or, or optical imaging or electrochemical sensing or PCR technology, next gen sequencing, have the technologies gone to a place where at least some part of the physical handling of this stuff could take place at point of care? If the answer is yes, you can ship the bytes to wherever the expert is, and that's pretty instantaneous. So my, my daughter here, who runs a large reference lab in India, actually works on that concept. 
saying, okay, I'll give you a, a quiz question, a trick question, but the answer is fairly obvious. There are 17,000 anatomical pathologists in the US. How many are in India? Any guess? 8,000? 80,000. Sign, the answer would be we wish. There's only 800 anatomical pathologists in India for a billion four people. Okay? And of those 800 pathologists, majority of them are very generalist histopathologists. The super specialization to say, I understand the molecular profile of this, this particular carcinoma or a very rare synovial sarcoma, that know-how does not exist. Where is that know-how? In the United States. So now the question is, while India is a combination of subcultures, about 800 million people live off of $4 a day, but there's 300 million people who are obscenely rich, who can afford Western quality healthcare. So while at a sociological level, of course, we'd like to address the whole problem, but to start with, we can be reductionist. At least try and bring good care to people who can afford it for the time being. So could it be that we do all of the TC component in India and do the PC component, if I could use your jargon, in the United States? So what have we done? We have deconstructed the value chain, separate the pathologist from his slide. I mean, there's that love of slide. I can't give up my microscope. It's no necessary, that's not necessary to do. Radiology adopted digital imaging some 20 years ago. Pathology somehow, the most expensive piece of equipment we had was a refrigerator, and somehow it, it <laughs> went, went by us. So at, 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 a, at a superficial level, of course, we can go digital, but at a more conceptual level, we are disintermediating the value chain and keeping value where it belongs. And now the question is, by so doing, we'll reduce the cost, obviously, over time, and then we can also address the other 800 million people. There's some hope for that. Okay, so the next thing is movement towards point of care. It's sort of a corollary for that. It's, I'm stating the obvious. Uh, infectious disease is an area I got interested in about six years ago while I was doing mostly cancer diagnostics. Uh, when you have young kids at home and when you travel to India, so there are 700 million people in India who self-prescribe antibiotics who self-prescribe antibiotics. We must change that. We should have more doctors. Yeah, let, if I magically open 1,000 more medical schools today, I still won't have enough doctors 12 years from now because that's how long it takes to train even the, the very basic. So that's not the answer. Now I can say, well, if, if I'm gonna be stupid enough, sorry, to self-prescribe an antibiotic, at least I can choose to be slightly less stupid. At least I should have some way of figuring out, is it virus, is it bacteria? I'm, I'm treading a very dangerous ground. Fleming himself wrote in 1929, superbugs will be created because all of the right reasons uh, you, you talked about. So we asked the following question, can we bring infectious disease diagnosis to point of care and do it in a very fundamental molecular way? There's no reason why we have to develop a culture that takes 72 hours and we guess and put people on broadband antibiotics. It's, it's nonsense. Enough technology has developed in the last 100 years that we can outdo that. So one of our portfolio companies called Click Diagnostics said, can we do PCR on a cartridge? So I'll cut the long story short. There's about a $400 device, that's the instrument, and a $2 cartridge that can do PCR at about five seconds per cycle, and about 40 cycles you have enough signal. Uh, that was the design. That's the actual uh, physical photograph of a first generation prototype, the optical sensing system, that's the, the prototype for the, for the instrument. And, and lo and behold, at about 40 cycles or so, you can do a fourplex and you can start seeing some good signal. Now, so if that famous uh, Marconi statement, so radio was invented, the question at the Royal Society in England was, what good is it? And the answer was, what good is a newborn baby? That was Marconi said in, in, the, in the late 1800s, what good is a newborn baby? What good is a newborn baby? I don't know. I don't know where this will be applicable. But I do believe the, this is a very interesting eclectic group of people. Uh, Lucy, you probably know Adam de la Zerda. He works in, you know him? He finally turned 30 yesterday, or day before yesterday. And this guy is a, I mean, I can't read his resume. It'll be a disservice to him. So he, he's a, he works in structural biology at Stanford. Then we have a guy called Greg Loney, who's an optical instrument guy. And we have a guy called Jesus Ching, who did, clinical assay development all his life, and we have a young lady called Michael Werner who does, um, who does 
uh, sort of global health type of stuff, studying India, China, uh, uh, Eastern Africa, and now she goes, and also the United States. For all the natural reasons. I mean, we, we move at a speed where this is. So, so then the question is, obviously, if we can do it at point of care, can we do it at, at the consumer side? And can we do at least near consumer? So I am not, I'm not suggesting that each person should have a PCR device at their home, and they should figure out its virus or bacteria, what ID, what resistance, and what antibiotic band. Not, that's not what I'm suggesting. I'm saying if I bring this hammer, somebody will figure out the right nails. And of course, we have to think holistically. We become so reductionist. That was another lesson we learned from Reinhardt. A reductionist doesn't innovation do. Yeah. So he sent me to Santa Fe Institute for a year, and the best service he could have done to me when I was 25 years old. A reductionist doesn't innovation do. So take a holistic, take a more systemic, system-wide approach. Uh, by the way, saliva is a Two minutes is all it takes. I'm at slide 86, and I have only 88 slides. So saliva is a, so about 50 to 60% of enzymes that are in blood are also available in saliva. Somehow, for reasons unknown to me, and probably because sample preparation is hard and all kinds of other stuff, saliva was never used in diagnostics, except for one or two notable exceptions. This gold mine of information. And if we have to do stuff that requires sort of the double quotes, clear waved type of situations where minimal skill is needed, minimum time is needed, low cost, sample prep is going to be extremely critical. And if you could do something with minimal sample prep, there's a plethora of information there. So I don't quite know how to use it yet, but I do know there is something to be used. Uh, movement towards a different subspecialty model. I mean, there are some breast cancers that are closer to ovarian cancers than to other breast cancers. So our subspecialty model that is that is morphology focused, that is focused on where the organ of origin was, it's subject to question. So a different subspecialty model has to evolve that somehow integrates morphology and molecules, and that brings me to my last topic, move towards an integrated diagnostics. I prefer to use the word non-reductionist diagnostics. Integrate kind of gives it an engineering flavor that I somehow pull radiology, pathology, all of that together. That has to be done. But I'm talking about a non-reductionist view a more systemic view as opposed to a componentized view. So anatomical radiology, functional radiology, clinical pathology, molecular diagnostics, tissue pathology. So there has to be, and of course it has to be by use case, by clinical use case. The right combination of morphology and molecules has to come together. So I believe this is a key trend. I believe this is the end of the beginning. We've been at the beginning for about 10 years. I think this is the end of the beginning. So when the beginning begins to translate into the real thing, innovation becomes a trend. And I believe the trend we're about to watch is non-reductionist diagnostics in our realm. Thank you very much. Excellent. We do, we do have some time for, um, for questions. Hi, thanks very much for a very interesting talk. Um, I, in, in healthcare, the value of a, a lab test was in doing the test. You had to do it. Uh, as we go forward, the value is the data and what I can do with the data. Could you talk to that a little bit in terms of comparability of data, how I can begin to correlate what may be generated in one diagnostic test which may be generated in another or in the practice or wherever. Absolutely, Thank you. yes. So first of all, the answer deserves uh, its place in a conversation at dinner or lunch. It's, it's a very complex question. Your, your premise of the question is, what can you say about the informatics that ought to sit above? You're absolutely right. So if I rewind the tape to 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, the device produced the data, and the analysis took place in somebody's head. That should not change. So if I rewind to radiology, a field I understood reasonably well when I was at Siemens, I've forgotten much of it and the field keeps improving, the device produced the data. And the onus of figuring things out was in the radiologist's head. Over time, that changed significantly. More and more value-add informatics got settled on top of the radiological data. And the radiologists didn't go away. I'm stating the obvious. They got 
relegated up to do more interesting conceptual thinking type of work. Diagnostics in the more general sense is no different. So the point I can make is there is two kinds of uh, informatics that have to take place. Well, I will call the small data and the big data just to uh, ride the bandwagon of the big data analytics. By micro or the small data is how best to analyze what I'm seeing for this patient. And there's a lot of analysis that needs to be done. So if I, if I talk to a, a sort of evolved pathologist, and there is quite a few of them, and you ask them, when I, when I look at cancer cells, actually the stromal cells next to it give me as much information as do the cancer cells when I'm looking at a basic h and &E slide. Now, it, it sits in somebody's head, so God forbid if somebody in my family had some aggressive prostate cancer, there's two people in this planet I'll trust. Mehul Amin at Cedar sinai and uh, Jonathan Epstein at, at, at Hopkins. What is it that they do, what is it that they do in their gestalt that I'm not able to replicate an algorithm? So the micro is going to be to replicate the gestalt, to replicate the non-reductionist thinking that's going in some really evolved pathologist's head. Then there is the macro. Can I use that information and update my model of the disease over time and feed it back to the model of disease? That requires, so I give you an anecdote. Siemens acquired a company called Shared Medical Systems in Malvern, Pennsylvania, um, some 20 odd years ago. And the first contract we signed was, unbeknown to most people, was with CDC. We were hosting 1,800 hospitals worth of data and our belief was, if there's a new strain to break, we'll be the first ones to know. So we were doing big data analytics before it was called big data. So there is, there is a dichotomy. There is sort of micro and small data, extremely complex. And then there is big data. Actually, I don't have a clue where even to begin. But in some specified disease segments, there's ample evidence that it works. Uh, we did an experiment uh, on, on uh, non-small cell lung carcinoma at Moffitt Cancer Center and in Mastro, University of Maastricht, Felix Lambin and, and forget the name of the guy from, from Moffitt, Bill Dalton. And they defined uh, a macro study where over a seven year period, they studied 17,000 patients. It's a non-published study, but enough data is available on it that talks about big data analytics, which models the disease or updates the model of disease based on the outcomes they're getting uh, given their disease profile, diagnostic tests, the drug they were on, et cetera, et cetera. Did I get close to the question you were asking? So maybe one more pressing question, if you if you'd like to, uh, just up on the up on the right there. Just up, uh, yeah, and then um, after the question, if everyone could just stay seated, because we're going to have something after after this. Hello. Okay. Uh, you mentioned real dialogue being between two people who have curiosity um, about each other's opinions. How do you set up systems? Oh, How do beautiful. you make that more commonplace? Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, so I I. I enjoy doing that, first of all. So if you go to a company called IDEO in Palo Alto, there's a large conference room and a whiteboard, and it says, build on other people's ideas. I say, yeah, that's obvious. It's the antidote of Van Gogh. It's obvious, so what's the point? So he goes, uh, I spoke with this guy, Denny, Denny Boyle, and he explained, we encourage people that even if they have a great idea, don't bring it up. Just build on what's being said already. Wait you will have your time under the sun. And sort of, please have an inefficient meeting. It, it jives with that. Uh, you know, there is, there is no substitute to strong leadership. So again, I keep going back to my, my hero. My, if I sound like I worship him or I'm in love with him, it's probably true. I have joked with him and saying, Eric, if you were 100 years younger and you were a woman and I was single, we'd be having a different conversation. <laughs> this number of ifs. And, <laughs> but th there was this, when you have this very strong, inspiring leadership, it, it somehow intuitively creates that framework. And, and people get weeded out. There are people who will not survive that system. And they get weeded out. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And, and you have to have this 10-year view to want to change your universe. And it's generally possible. At least I've had two mini experiences of 10 years each that, that shows that's possible. But it, it requires very involved leadership who gives a damn about innovation. Great, thank you. Let's thank Kajit again for a wonderful talk.